now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Orson Welles was in a 1949 motion picture, The Third Man, in which Welles was the third man, and that was adapted into a series uh, by uh, Harry Allen Towers and his program, and his, I should say his company, Towers of London, into the lives of Harry Lime. And so you'll hear lots of reference to this show as The Third Man. It's a prequel to that Third Man motion picture from 1949. This episode of The Lives of Harry Lyme was originally broadcast November 30th, 1951. The story of Three Farthings. Presenting Orson Welles as The Third Man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the motion picture The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie The Third Man, yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. No. He had many lives. And I can tell you about all of them. How? Because my name is Harry Lyme. I have in my hand here a farthing. This is the smallest of small coins. In England, which is where they come from, a farthing won't buy you the second section of day before yesterday's newspaper. In fact, you could hardly describe a farthing as money at all. Once upon a time, however, there was a farthing that was worth 20,000 pounds. It happened this way. You see, I have a girlfriend, beautiful and mad as the moon, called Lady Fortune. We're on fairly intimate terms, the lady and I. I know her by her maiden name, Miss Fortune. She had a lot to do with a particular farthing I've been talking about. I haven't forgiven her yet. I think it's mutual. Stick around if you're interested. I'll tell you about it. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man in Three Farthings for Your Thought. <laughs> in Liverpool, sitting in a pub, which is English for bar or grill or saloon to you, having myself a drink and mulling over a few little business possibilities. A young woman was talking, rather arguing with the bartender. She seemed familiar, and he seemed annoyed, brushed her aside. Then she drew a gun from her purse, and I started to be a good deal more interested. Everybody! Everybody! Your hands up! Empty your pockets and put the money on this table. Step forward quickly. Come on, one at a time. All right. Here you are. A bad test here for robbing the poor. No, you can keep the paper money. All I want are the coins. What do you mean? Can I keep the poor? I said only the coins. Oh, I'll take you, ma'am. Bartender, empty your cash register. You'll be sorry, You'll lady. be sorrier if you don't do as I say. There it is. You're next, mister. Oh, yes, indeed. I'll be glad to contribute. If anyone tries to follow me, I'll shoot him. Stay where you are. None of you were really robbed. Just a few coins. Oh, 
That woman's daft. Come in here asking me to give her all the farthings. I told her she was crazy and she gave me the gun. The things that go on in this pub, I could write a book. I could. I don't know what this world's coming to. We used to have fine upstanding robberies. I know even the crooks are neurotic. How much do I owe you, bartender? Five bob. Here you are. I've no change. I'll roll them for double or nothing. All right. Here are the cubes. Anything over seven, you win. Okay. Hmm, number seems to be 12. Thank you for your hospitality, and good evening to you all. As I walked out of the pub, I suddenly remembered who that woman was. Bill Barrett's wife, Helen. Barrett was just sent up for a long stretch in prison. He'd robbed a bank and gotten away with a big haul. 20,000 pounds, I think it was. Never did find the money. There was nothing crazy about Helen. She was up to something. I felt that I ought to be a participant. I called up a friend and got her address. Who's there? It's all right. It's Harry. Harry? I don't know you. I'm a friend of Bill's. I don't know you. Harry Lyme. You didn't recognize me at the pub, Helen? Yes, I saw you there. Well, what are you up to? Nothing. Collecting farthings to while away the time while Bill's in prison? It's really none of your business. Oh? Well, you never get the money back if you try to do this yourself. How do you know it has to do with money? Look, Helen, you need help. Cut me in for a, a quarter and I'll do the work for you. Well, uh, I don't know. Suit yourself. I have another deal. I don't know whether Bill would like He's in it. jail. Can't do anything. I'm out here free as a bird. You're talking to the most experienced and clever man in the business. Yes or no? All right. Okay. Now brief me on this farthing kick. Well, Bill sent me a letter with a couple of farthings in it. Hmm. It's a puzzle to me. Here's the letter. Go on, you read it. Dearest Helen, here are three farthings which I promised sweet little Daphne... Please tell Uncle Ned to write me. I love you and wait eagerly for you to visit me. Love, Bill. P.S. Yesterday I wrote a new arrangement for the orchestra. We played some of Beethoven's piano pieces. We've no niece named Daphne. Where are the three farthings? There were only two in the letter. Well, where, are the, where are the two? The maid who worked for me stole my purse with all my coins. I traced her to the pub. Did you get I any thought of... they might be in the till or someone's pocket, you know, given an exchange. Yes, change. but did you get any of the farthings back? No. Well, what about the other part of the letter about Beethoven, the orchestra? I don't think it means anything. You know Bill used to be a composer before he went into yeah. the business. Where's the maid live? I don't know. She doesn't live at the address she gave me, but I traced her to the pub. The bartender knows her. Her name's Lily. The coins are probably a clue to where the money's hidden. He only sent you two of the three coins. That's, that's very queer. Helen, I'll be back in a few hours. But just one more thing. What happened to his partner in the, the bank robbery? You mean Johnny Baxter? Yes. Hmm. He's been here a couple of times threatening me, wanting to know where the money's hidden. Well, that's good. Doesn't know where it is either. I'm sure Bill isn't going to let him know. He sure isn't. They hate each other. Baxter is a dirty double crosser. Sure, sure, I know him. Can't be trusted. Where are you going? Well, I've just developed a new hobby, Helen, old girl. There's a wonderful big word for it. Numismatics, I think. It means a collector of coins. I'm going out collecting coins. See you soon. Before I went to look up Lily, the thieving maid, I paid a visit to prison. Now, I have an instinctive dislike for this barbaric social institution, but... Business is business. Since they didn't know me in Liverpool, I wouldn't have any trouble. You say you're from the Overland Bank Insurance, Mr. Lyne? Yes, Governor. I wonder if I may see Mr. Barrett. Why? We insure the bank for robberies, you know, and just a few formal questions for our record. Uh, necessary. Sorry, but I, I don't think it's possible. Well, I've been an investigator for many years. This is the first time I've ever, ever been denied. You are not being denied communication with the prisoner. I don't understand. You'll understand all right, Mr. Lyme, when I tell you William Barrett has escaped. Escaped? Just about an hour ago. Well, well I must say this is a rather slipshod way of running a penal institution. <laughs> This is 
Harry. Have you heard? Yes, the police are all over the place. Bartender will tell you where to reach me. I understand. Barrett will be sure to be in hiding for several weeks. It was my fondest hope to recover the bank money long before then. In my arithmetic, one quarter of 20,000 is uh, 20,000. I went back to the pub and spoke to the bartender. Ten pound note and he was my friend for life. I still might need Helen, so I gave him my hotel address. He also told me where I could find Lily, the housemaid. She was quite a wench. Nice and blonde and very frightened. She didn't look a bit like a housemaid. The room was richly furnished and she was dressed in an extremely elegant red silk robe. There must be some mistake. You are Lily Johnson? Uh, that's my name. You work for a Mrs. Barrett? Mrs. Barrett? Yes, that's what I said. Oh, uh, yes. She's someone I met. You were her housemaid? Yes. How do you manage to keep up a place like this on the salary of a housemaid? It's a friend's apartment. Don't you mean John Baxter? I had nothing to do with the robbery, believe He me. sent you to work for Mrs. Barrett. You read the letter and stole the farthings. Give me your handbag. There's nothing in Give there. Give it to me. Ah, what have we here? Lipstick, compact, perfume. It is. It's a farthing. Now, where's the other? Mrs. Barrett must still have the other. Lily, for once I think you're telling the truth. I'm going to let you go, Lily. You're just lucky I have a weakness for blondes. I hurried out, the farthing in my pocket. It was late now, and I wanted to get out of that neighborhood and fast. It was deserted, no cab in sight. I knew I was being tailed. I turned a corner and caught a quick flash of two men. I quickly threw the farthing in a garbage can. And I tried to make a run for it. It's no good struggling, Lime. We've got you. All right, Lime, give it up. All right. What's up, boys? Where's the farthing? I threw it away. You threw it away, eh? All right. Now, uh, where is it? Mm. You know, you fellas can be arrested for assault. Empty your pocket. Okay, okay. okay. Let me see. A couple of halfpennies, half crown and a shilling. Yeah, he's hiding it. Let's drag him in this hallway where we can search him. No, no, wait Bring a minute. Him by the no, shoulders. Just a minute, just please. Just a minute, nothing. Give him a taste of the blackjack belt. We've got work to do. But, but now... November 30th, 1951, The Lives of Harry Lime on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now more of The Lives of Harry Lime, November 30th, 1951. I came to about an hour later in a dark, dank hallway off the street. My clothes were all ripped up and strewn about. I staggered to my feet, got into my clothes, and then went out to find the garbage can where I'd thrown the farthing. And I found it, lying on a discarded newspaper, put it in my pocket, went back to my hotel. Helen. I've been waiting here for two hours. Oh, I ran into a, a few people who detained me, as you can see here, don't you? <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> What's wrong, Helen? I found Bill. Where? Near the waterfront. Oh, that's too bad. I'll have a couple of years to a sentence. <laughs> they can't do anything to him anymore. What do you mean? He, he was shot in the chest. Dead? Yes. It's too bad, honey. It settles our partnership. You're quitting? Yes, that's what I'm doing. Why? Well, they'll suspect me as soon as the police find I'm not an insurance investigator. I don't know what you mean. I'm getting out of Liverpool, Helen. I've got to. You're going to leave me? I'm going to leave you, yes. You can say that again. Oh, I lied to you, Harry. Okay, you lied to me. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to change my clothes and... Catch a plane to London. Uh, did, did you find the other father? Yes, I managed to get it and keep it. I have the other one. I know. 
I, I, I didn't trust you. But now that Bill's gone... You're willing to go half with me? Yes, Harry. Uh, but, Helen, you forget, uh, I've resigned from this partnership. <gasps> Here is the farthing. Hmm. Nothing very unusual about it, except that two numbers of the date in 1941 are scratched. That nine and the four, see? That's right. No. I would never have noticed it. Let's take a look at my farthing. Nothing on this side. On the obverse, the tail of the bird is scratched. <gasps> also, two letters in farthing, the A and the R. Put them together, and it's Taylor. Taylor, that's oh. it. 94 Taylor, 94 Taylor Street. Oh, if we only had the missing coin. Well, we have the address. Uh, maybe we could take a quick look at it. There's no plane leaving until tomorrow anyway. Well, it might be worth a try. Uh, the money's in the house. Know anyone at that address? Well, uh, it sounds familiar. Think hard. I, I, I can't remember. Well, there's nothing to do but pay a visit to 94 Taylor Street. Two farthings could just possibly add up to 20,000 pounds. Stop here, driver. Okay. Okay, Helen. Here you are. This isn't 94. Hmm. I know. I'd rather walk up to it slowly. Very dark. Hmm. The darker, the better. Yeah, I don't remember this street. Maybe we figured it wrong. Hmm, maybe, maybe. Look, if you want to go home, Helen, after all, you've had a very tough day. I'll take my chances. You don't trust me, huh? I didn't mean that. If we get the money, we we can go off to Italy or some place. I'm like... afraid that wouldn't be such a very, very good idea. Why? You don't like me? Helen, how can you say that? I liked you from the first, but it would be very unhealthy for you and I to be traveling together. Don't forget you happen to be the wife of a murdered prisoner. recognize the house? No. The number's familiar, but Bill operated from a number of places which he talked about, but I, I never saw. Mm. Single family dwelling, well-to-do people, I think. Yeah. The windows are boarded up. No one seems to be living in the well, house. That's all to the good. How are we going to get in? I have a couple of skeleton keys, very handy things to carry around. You keep a sharp watch while I work on the door. Hmm? Oh, hurry. Helen... Why don't you go home? I'll get in touch with you. I'm staying with you. Okay. Well, I'm going to have trouble with this door. Wait. What's the matter? I thought I heard someone inside. I don't hear anything. Oh, it must have been my imagination. Kid, this isn't a profession for imaginative people. Oh, I'm sorry, Harry. Flashlight. Yeah. Walk on your full tread, heel and toe. Don't tiptoe. I am. No. Close the door softly. It looks like it's deserted. The dust and. I have a queer feeling about this place. This seems to be the drawing room. Hmm. Here's the light switch. Stay where you are. <gasps> Sorry to have busted in on you. I. <laughs> Just we're in the wrong house. That's the... And your little blonde housemaid. Well, we're all together now. Stand up against that wall. Both of you. As you say, Baxter. You killed Bill. Against the wall, Helen. You'll hang for this, you will. You do as I say or you'll join your double-crossing husband. Now, okay, we haven't got the money. You might as well let us go. If you make another move, I'll kill you. Don't bother, old man. I'm not moving. Now. Now, tell me where it's hidden. I wish I could, but I, I don't know. I don't believe you. That's the trouble with people in our line of business. Nobody believes anybody else. Come on, come on. Where is it? Believe me, I don't know. We came here to find it. How did you know it was here? The address on was on the problem. farthings. All right. All right, then. Let me have the coins. I haven't got them. Helen has. Get that purse, Lily. Right. That's right. Now open it. 
Here they are. Huh. Why, where's the third farthing? Bill never sent it. You're lying. He never did, I swear it. I want the third coin. I'm leaving, Baxter. I don't have... I'm going to give you one minute in which to hand over the missing farthing. Just one minute. November 30th, 1951, The Lives of Harry Lime. The conclusion, along with the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, comes up after this break. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now the conclusion of Orson Welles and the lives of Harry Lyme, going back to November 30th, 1951. You know that bad look, you're just one of those unpleasant people that gives our trade such a bad name. He meant what he said about killing us. No doubt about that. He said one minute, and he he meant one minute. I had to do something. I got myself shot. My back was against the wall, my left shoulder against the light switch. A quick movement with that shoulder, and I switched off the lights. He fired. I stopped at the same time. I came at him from the side and threw him down. He fired again. That one mussed up my hair. I seized his arm with one hand and grabbed his ear with the other and tried to pull it off. He kicked at me rather viciously and nearly broke one of my ribs. I lost my hold on his ear and just managed to get his hair. I pulled his head back and banged it against the floor. I had hopes that by the eighth or ninth bang, he'd get discouraged and give up. He didn't. I let go and smashed him on the jaw. His body relaxed for a minute. I seized the gun and jabbed it into his head. Like a good sport, he gave up the struggle. Don't you... Turn the light on, Helen. Now it's your turn to stand against the wall. You too, Lily. You're not going to shoot us. You... Just keep your hands up and maybe I won't. Maybe... Maybe you and I... We can work out... Some... Whose house is this? Oh, no one lives here anymore. It used to belong to one of Bill's friends. We... We bought the property. We used it in our deals. He was a composer, just like Bill. Oh, I suppose so. All them music records. Oh, yeah. One whole wall was completely covered with bins for music records. I ran my eye across it and remembered the letter, the letter that Bill wrote to his wife when he sent her the two farthings. He mentioned something about Beethoven piano pieces. And then it hit me. I remembered Beethoven wrote a piano piece called Fury Over a Lost Farthing. And that's where it was, in the music of Beethoven's piano sonatas, of course. The Lost Farthing. I walked over to the record bins, and then another thing hit me. The police. Again, the police. I was too late. The shots had aroused the neighborhood, naturally. Someone had phoned the cops. Too late. Mr. Lyme, get aboard. Yes, sir. If ever you set foot in England, Mr. Lyme, we'll throw you in prison on sight. Well, I shall make every effort, sir, to have my good name cleared. In the meantime, you're being deported. I helped capture a notorious criminal. This is my reward. It just goes to prove what I've always said. Franklin was wrong. Franklin? What Franklin? Uh, One of my countrymen officers, his first name was Ben. He used to say that honesty is the best policy. Well, if it pleases you to joke... It doesn't please me, officer, and believe me, I'm not laughing. Not a farthing's worth. Goodbye now. You'll hear from me, officer. I'll send you a postcard. And now, Harry Lyme. Thus, rather abruptly, the affair of the three farthings came to an end. I had time on the boat to think it over, it being a fairly long voyage with no passengers who cared to play games of chance with a stranger. I went over my books and couldn't find much of anything that wasn't pretty well in the red. My investments were as follows. 
Beaten up badly once, beaten mildly once, once nearly murdered. Also one flannel suit, practically new, damaged beyond repair. My assets, as I say, were very vague. More conservative businessmen than I put their profits in a bank. My money was in an album of Beethoven records. Of course, I have every hope of getting my money back. Oh, yes, indeed, some fine day your Uncle Harry will get back into England by hook or crook, probably the latter. And then he'll go up to Mr. Beethoven and say, my money, please, I want to make a withdrawal. Yes, friends, you can write down the whole farthing deal as my unfinished symphony. November 30th, 1951, The Lives of Harry Lime on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part three of the five-part Years Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Henderson Matter. This episode originally broadcast November 30th, 1955. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Eve Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Ah, the case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole thing... Hold on now, son, hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, I better come there. You know how folks are around here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Culver, Montana, to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48, one day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-196667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. Have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Mm-hmm. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents, postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve. I... Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well, anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh, when... Uh, t- today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, the, the room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It, it's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Aha. Uh-huh. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay. No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, you go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? 
Mr. Dollar, I'd, I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one. The mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two. When they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three. Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of, kind of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police. So don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, we had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop, no, hold on. Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it. I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George. Born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Yeah, he wasn't a suicide type. So... Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. Well, you have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again. Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm... And let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's. I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah, <sighs> sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. 
Expense account item six, $4.92, tank of gas. I borrowed Sheriff Holton's car and drove the 80-odd miles to Great Falls that afternoon. Mr. Thurber bought lunch. My Lord, I hope there isn't anything to all this, Mr. Dollar. I just hope there isn't. George Henderson. My. Yeah, well, there isn't anything to anything yet, Mr. Thurber. I'm still trying to find out the facts. Oh, I knew you were over in Culver. I tried to call you there a couple of times. You were out both times. Finally, I put in a call to the home office in Hartford. I talked to this man, Connors, with the adjustment agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in, and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh-huh. Now, oh, look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case... But two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls. He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out? Yes, I suppose so. I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have Wait a any. minute. Matty Knickerbocker. Just a school teacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left in my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, of I, I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Oh, somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. And it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. Well, tell me about them. Go ahead, Mr. Thurber. Uh, Now, look, accidents rarely have reason behind them. Suicides and murders always do. You don't think it was an accident? Well, let's say I've heard enough and seen enough to make it a draw so far. Go ahead, tell me about them. And I wish I was married to Mrs. Henderson. I mean, I wish she could see me. I think most any man who's ever met her hoped the same thing. Young men, old men, any kind. But she picked George. George was as tough and leathery as these mountains around us, exactly her opposite. But Pauline married him. He raised her. He was close to her all her adult life. Yes. Mr. Dollar, you know and I know she didn't have to marry him. She could have married anybody here in Culver or anybody in London or Paris. You see what I mean? And Not quite. Well... I always had the idea that after she married him, she kept letting him know she could have had anybody else she wanted. Go ahead, Thurber. I think she married him for his money. I think she would have killed him for his money. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the whole affair becomes a town issue, and I become the town goat. Incidentally, let me take a moment to say thanks for the many kind letters you've sent. We appreciate them more than you know. And I only wish it were possible to answer them all personally. Again, thank you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
November 30th, 1955. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. A reminder to contact my friend Ted at RadioMemories.com. He has a whole slew of yours truly, Johnny Dollar stories available on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. Check out with Ted at RadioMemories.com. RadioMemories.com. He's done a whole bunch of restoration. And so his shows that he has now, he has more than ever, and they sound excellent. That's RadioMemories.com. My webpage, ClassicRadio.stream. Stream our shows on demand. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. Find our social media links. Contact me. And if you want to help us, you can buy me a coffee there. That buy me a coffee money goes to help us extend our classic radio collection. All righty, thanks for tuning in. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.